Um, of course, better connectivity regarding uh, rural and urban connectivity, allowing indigenous people to reach the city. And um, in the case that I'm presenting, it is articulated to the railroad that started uh, from 1930 to let's say end of 2008. That, and and the, the railway was uh, the backbone uh, of the cities where they they went into the train to, to search for better opportunities and left their ancestral territories. And then this railroad was substituted by, of course, um, the highways. And um, the highways were improved and connected better the cities and the rural settlements. A third element of this migration um, is the conceptualization of the indigenous as a stagnation uh, as to state in the past. So um, this also promoted indigenous people uh, to search for development and to adopt this notion of development. Um, and, and we also have it as um, understanding that we need education, uh, economic growth and etc. And that implies that families migrate to the cities. So in this context, what is going on with traditional territories? Um, we have consequences uh, both uh, for the uh, traditional territories and the city as well. So within the traditional territory, we see um, that uh, there's um, familiar distancing because uh, normally um, the elders stay in the city and the youth goes to the goes to the cities uh, to search for better opportunities. And so in the same sense, there's a reduction in the economical activity uh, regarding livestock and agriculture, of course. Um, so, so we, we see home gardens uh, that are abandoned, that uh, they are useless, but they are, they are the evidence that uh, sometime before the, there was economic activity within these territories. So as well as a consequence of this migration, um, we have a circulation between traditional territories and cities, um, especially people who have a property rights uh, usually come back to, to the traditional territories to smaller villages. And, and we have this circulation uh, that is uh, promoted by, by some traditional activities that are taking place uh, in the cities. And there's also a dispersed uh, urban settlement in peripheric um, populations. We, we don't actually see a um, population that is purely indigenous, but we see a mixture. Um, however, during the last years, um, we have seen some projects led by the state um, that uh, want to uh, revitalize the indigenous identity within certain uh, villages. So I would like to note that uh, the economical activity and the indigenous peoples and lands are interrelated. So um, within the, the case that I present, um, we can name a certain type of potato um, that was being uh, being marketed uh, and exchanged uh, while, while the, the population was um, descending to, to the cities and at the end, uh, that finally disappeared. So here um, we have a concept that is re-territorialization. 
uh, where the indigenous people uh, find himself within the city. Um, we also see here this concept of uh, place making. Um, but uh, regarding this place, I think we, 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 we have to question the indigenous uh, culture because being indigenous is, is not only a relationship uh, with the individual self, but with uh, the other individuals, the territory and the territory itself. So place making is, is a, a process um, promoted, of course, uh, by the people but as well as a combination of different um, drivers regarding the expression of the community within the territory. Regarding this, the indigenous peoples have some difficulties on um, making the same within uh, urban context. We can find in certain villages, uh, indigenous families, and regarding my research, we can also find um, markets that have indigenous participation. I will I will analyze very briefly uh, with uh, consumers, intermediaries, and producers. Uh, when people uh, go to Rica, uh, where indigenous peoples uh, go to Rica, they they assume the um, agrarian work. But they're not only producers, um, they are also living uh, in the city uh, to commercialize their products. Uh, this is happening uh, from the 60s, where the city increased in population from 40,000 to 90,000. Um, and the indigenous families that actually came uh, to the outskirts of Arica, and as well as the families that stayed um, in there saw the, the potential of the exchange and saw the potential of taking these exchanges to the city. So in Arica, it um, began a itinerant market where, where people were uh, rotating around the city to sell their, their products. Um, after some time, the city decided to allocate them in a specific place, uh, which is this this place, this market place, uh, we'll say. The agropecuarian terminal is composed by different uh, moments, let's say. Um, during our first stage uh, in 1974, where, where this uh, market is uh, permanently established, um, begins here, administrated by a cooperative till 1974. And with that time passing by, there were a lot of difficulties uh, because agriculture were not the ones administering the cooperative. So, so the, the claims of the agriculture were not met. And therefore, in 1982, uh, an association arose uh, of small and medium agricultures of farmers, uh, and there was created a, another market. And so finally, there's a, a growing process of the market uh, that uh, came in 1989 with Agricola del Norte. Um, Everyone, we're speaking about um, a sector that is outside Arica. This is that this was very uh, marginal at the time, but as a space uh, began to also populate um, with social housing that it still uh, that that continues still, um, especially because inside the city there's little space. Um, for housing building. Um, so the space itself is very complex because we're not only talking about a, a space where, where, where farmers were uh, descendants from indigenous families are um, looking to establish themselves uh, in an organized 
um, it, it was not emerging out of nowhere. So these these places uh, were uh, terra nullis. So they started uh, selling their products, and a, 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 a space begins to, to be created, uh, not only uh, economical, but uh, also social, let's say, because of this exchange of products and money. But the indigenous subject um, allocates uh, an identity to this place. And, and 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 this was only through uh, agriculture um, within within this place we we can see of course uh, vegetables fruits but as well uh, we can see uh, tools you can find clothes uh, you can also find services uh, such as hairdressers uh, and etc so um uh, this is the space uh, from the heights. Uh, we can see that it's next to the valley. In in some sense, um, of this strong uh, relationship. Even when at some point uh, it was in the outskirts of the city, uh, with the expansion of the city, it, it has been being incorporated uh, into the city. So at the right, uh, you can see some some housing that are military houses. And on the left, we can see the beginning of the valley that has also suffered the expansion of this. So the space itself is an intersection of uh, the social housing and, and and the raising of social housing uh, more valued because of the type of population. So this organization itself allows um, an appropriation of this, culturally speaking. We, we hear um, the Aymara language inside the market, see as well uh, products that are Tika or Aymara that came from, from far, far away. And this is another city from from a sector um, where the trucks uh, with the products uh, come into the markets that are constantly um, providing um, not only the market, but uh, the city as well. So there's a link, there's a very important link uh, that that becomes the market into a core. Uh, so the city has access to different products. So um, there's a very interesting uh, thing about um, why, why the, the place was created uh, in terms of uh, culture uh, beyond economic aspects. So within the market, you can uh, see traditional products. Um, with, uh, let's say, a nostalgia aspect, because um, let's say there are antique products that you don't see anymore uh, in the city. They, 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 they speak about certain fruits that uh, are from a certain uh, part of, of the country or the municipality that has a strong relationship with the land and the indigenous peoples that cultivated uh, their fruit uh, or, or that project um, on the valleys uh, surrounding Arica, the city. So there's also a lot of medicinal herbs and maybe uh, we, we can see it. Um, we see many, many people selling them uh, in the place and they are also part of the traditional aspect of uh, indigenous families. And uh, to, to, to end up my presentation, I took this picture yesterday um, for uh, all of saints. Uh, this is uh, the celebration 
that uh, they, they, they do. This is Tanza Wawa, which is a bread uh, that you leave for people at the cemetery. And this has also this, con this cultural connotation. So sometimes, uh, well, I, I, I don't want to speak too much for the rest of the, of the presentation, uh, for the presentations. Um, but uh, I think that uh, with these kind of places, we, we tend to address them uh, as economic spaces or social spaces um, at the most, but the, the cultural uh, sense is a little bit lost. Even though they are designed as an uh, economic space, uh, they, they, they also um, come with an identity and uh, within uh, its narratives, it um, has as well embodies an identity and the identity of the people working there. So um, the is again some elements um, that that makes it more than an economic uh, space, uh, such as supermarket, for example. Uh, everything is is a commodity. Everything uh, is uh, commercialized. Um, you see a mango, uh, and that's okay. But if you see a mango. Uh, within this this indigenous mar market, it has an identity. It comes from some place, and you can actually uh, even see the the producer, the indigenous producer. So um, we 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 shall note that the indigenous families um, made this place a place of identity um, that is sometimes regarded as a touristical place as well, but sometimes not as well regarded as um, maintenance of the culture and as a way of appropriating the territory, where families, uh, where indigenous families can actually spread their culture, even when they have migrated to the city, even when there has been a segmented assimilation of their personalities. And uh, anyway, it, it stays. It is it is there, of course, with modifications um, regarding the city. So this is my presentation. I think I'm in the time. Thank you. Buenos días. Voy a reemplazar al profesor Mauro. Mi nombre es Diego Benavente, soy partícipe del Grupo de Estudios Interculturales. Good morning, I'm going to replace Professor Mauro. My name is Diego Benavente. I'm part of the Group of Intercultural and Urban Territorial Studies. I'm going to introduce you the, the next talk that is about the urban normativity versus the territorial conceptions and practices of the Maya people in Merida, Yucatan, Mexico. This is in charge of Rolando Magaña. Observa bien la Can you see the presentation correctly? I cannot listen to you. I think it's okay. Perfect. They're going to tell you when you have two minutes left, so you can start wrapping up. Perfect. 
First of all, thank you very much for accepting my presentation. It is a presentation that it's called Urban Normativity versus the Territorial Conceptions and Practices of the Maya People in Merida, Yucatan, Mexico. The goal of this small task is to describe and analyze the normative dynamics of urban growth related to the conceptions and practices in the territory of the contemporary Maya in the southeast of Mexico. These reflections are based on part of my PhD research with a group of inhabitants from the Chap local community. In these two localities are different struggles related to the claims for land of common use as I'm going to tell you now. In order to begin, I want to give you some background information. The Yucatan Peninsula is in the southeast of Mexico. It is made of three states, Campeche, Yucatan, and Quintana Roo. In this peninsula, a huge amount of the population has Mayan origins. As you can see in this table, the state of Yucatan, that it is in the center in the map, is with a shape of a triangle. It has a 30% of Mayan heritage. We have Mayan inhabitants They live in ejidos or agrarian communities. They result historically from uh, the Mexican Revolution in 1910. As you can see here, the three states that make up the Yucatan Peninsula have a different number of ejidos. Most of them are located in the Yucatan state as well. What is the difference between ejido and agrarian community is that ejidos received lands they received this land as a restoration form, let's say, and these lands were recognized. Although there were some imagined communities asking for the recognition of their territories, Another territory that we're going to analyze from Hacienda Nequenera. They had this sense in the state recognized the origin of the territory. So with this small explanation, in Yucatan, just one agrarian community exists in this part in the page color. Nowadays, this results in a big part of the population having an ejido or agrarian community state and may 
most of the lands, most of the area of the territory is of common use. Here in this small map, we can see how a huge part or lands that are part of the social property. They are not private property. As I was telling you, I'm going to concentrate in a place to develop the objective of this talk. So I'm going to talk about the community of Chaplecal that is located 17 kilometers north of the city of Merida. Uh, the inhabitants of the city are around 3,626. Um, they speak Mayan tongue. A 20% of them speak a Mayan language. This doesn't mean that many people recognize themselves as Mayan. More than 60% of the population consider themselves as Maya or indigenous. So filters such as CDE, <laughs> the Commission for Indigenous Development, they state that 50% are indigenous. And there is a, a straight relation between the indigenous population and the economical conditions that are precarious. So most of the indigenous populations do not have access or have difficult access to education. They work and they don't receive a remuneration. And they do not live in the metropolitan area of the city or very close to the city. So not many young people get to complete their secondary education, their high school education. As we were saying before, regarding to housing from 1885 to 1929, communities lose a huge part of their territory. This is the case of Chablecal, and we can see it in this small map. All of the properties of the owners expanded their surfaces, their area. So the communities have a very small crop areas, areas for farming. So here we see Chablecal that had thousands of hectares and during the Hacienda Zamora, it was reduced to 250 something hectares. So this is just for you to have an idea of how this period was for modern communities. If, uh, throughout the time with this conflicts, this struggles for three, three, from 1922 to 1923, the start of the revolutionary empire, let's say, began. And communities want to divide land. In 1910, nonetheless, there was a lot of resistance from property, from the owners. So for Mayans, it was really difficult for this to happen. Until March 22, there was no socialist uh, government in the region. So this 
territories started to be recovered in the areas where they were settled. So that was, um, that is nowadays a big part of the metropolitan area. So there was a distribution of the land from the people and some of them such as Leclerc receive a portion of land. As I was telling you before, this was a very long process. Um, Chaplecal and others received officially from the state formally some pieces of land, people who were in charge of um, doing this measuring of the land, carried out this job. So they were asking them for access to the engineers as well, for access to land. In the case of Chablecan in 1936, they received their planning. I don't want to say that this is the current territory, but something like this it is. What we see here is, although there were some changes from 1927 until 1986, a large part of the land of Ejidos have their own rules. They say that the land is for the ones who work on them their families, so they had a new figure and they would say, okay, I need a piece of land to grow vegetables, to grow fruits. It is not to do business, it is just for livelihood. So there is this conception of land as something very important for humans, something key for humans. One of the main changes carried out in the 80s is repairing the conditions for the Yucatan, the entry of Yucatan. So they start a program that it's financed by the Glo World Bank And this is for investment. So this program starts, there are some issues with connection. It's only, um, to make the owners as the real owners of their lands. And they were also available uh, to sell their lands. And this is something that had been uh, planned for a long time in a context of, uh, of poverty um, that the farmer um, sold his land to allow the investment. So, a, a big part of what um, was used as uh, common use land was, uh, was seized. Oh, you're, you're uh, reaching the time. Oh, I've got two minutes. Okay. So what we're going to see here is how many of these uh, practices 
um, where uh, territorial conception activities uh, are being performed within the Mayan territory begin to be threatened by the urban growth. So this is what happened uh, between 98 and 2010. And uh, several in investments arose regarding urban growth through several projects, um, for example, uh, mega projects uh, for um, private uh, universities and stadiums. We can also think about the concept of urban extractivism for private farms. And also it, it began a, a strong speculation and territory hoarding. Um, so in Chavecal, this territory, uh, within this new process of liberalization of land, they almost lost 70% of their territory. So uh, the people had to urbanize their, themselves um, to recover their lands, um, but they also claimed their, their culture and their forms of territoriality. I think, sadly, I cannot speak uh, much about it. I think it's very inter interesting. It's, of course, the topic of the seminar, but I think we can leave it for the discussion. But also, I wanted to signal uh, that this um, generated several movements of um, struggles uh, for the recovery of the lands against the state that facilitated, uh, of course, these processes of dispossession dispossession that um, respond to a logic of, of colonialism and, and neoliberalization of the land. So I think um, this is the essential part of my presentation, but I will share the document. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rolando. I think after the discussion we can uh, Deep, uh, some some other things that left that we left behind. Um, so now we go with Magdalena Ugarte, methodologies for the territorial reconstruction in Walmap. Hello, good morning. Hi, Diego. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, I'll share the presentation here. Just a second. Just a second. Uh, here I'm, I'm sharing my screen. I, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Diego, maybe if you can... Tell us that, that you can see it. Oh, okay, perfect. So um, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation to share our presentation. I'm the adjunct uh, professor at the Metropolitan University of Toronto, and I'm here with my colleague, Natalia Caniwan, which is um, associated professor of the Center of uh, indigenous studies. Uh, let's see the slide here. So today we're going to present. Yes, we can see it now. Uh, we're going to present some reflections on a project uh, going on that we're developing um, together with uh, a colleague that is not here right now, but that are part of the Lafkenti territory, which is a collaborative uh, project on territorial um, ordering that seeks um, to reconstruct um, the knowledge um, of the indigenous peoples that are um, still within the collective memory and, and the territories. Um, we're going to be speaking about the methodolog methodological aspects um, of the project 
um, such as, for example, um, oral memory, uh, some in ground, uh, underground um, uh, researches. And you see here uh, the article uh, that focused on uh, decolonization on the south. So the uh, structure of the presentation, uh, we can we are going to present uh, some of the context and the theoretical framework uh, that, of course, support our project uh, and to present uh, afterwards the, the, the project. And of course, uh, we, we we have uh, we want so much to to discuss uh, on this type of project. So um, regarding a context. Um, uh, we, we revised a little bit uh, the process of colonization at this state. Uh, the Chilean state um, carried out um, regarding the dispossession of the indigenous peoples, especially the Mapuche. So we, we have a uh, defy here, uh, a challenge here um, to, to understand this memory, um, to to uh, bring us to the to the very origins of this procession uh, so to try to understand the territory and and to how uh, the territory was lived um, during the the origin when uh, land grant titles were taken away normally um, the, the the memory uh, thanks thanks to their own processes of, of uh, colonization, are very hard, it's very hard to find. Um, we, um, well, also this project uh, interlinks with uh, claim processes uh, that are taking place in the territory um, within different processes, uh, territorial process of um, cultural claim as well. So this is this is our research from uh, the social aspect of this all. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I had my microphone up. So yes, um, maybe thinking in terms of the theoretical framework, uh, some influences um, that supported the this work. Um, we of course. Uh, begin from spatial disciplines, particularly um, I study planning. So planning somehow urbanism, geography as well, and some disciplines uh, such as our architecture have been, uh, of course, fundamental to facilitate this dispossession uh, that Natalia is talking about. So, um, uh, um, military occupation is um, inseparable from the settlement of cities that really allowed uh, this operationalization uh, of, of um, the cities and the colonization on Mapuche territories. Uh, we also have um, the role that some instruments that today we associate with um, spatial disciplines, such as uh, surveying, uh, the sale of the land, the renaming of um, certain names that were uh, Mapuche names, of course, um, the reimagining of uh, private property, that is something that the seminar um, is trying to address. All these mechanisms that are legitimated by the legal way have uh, been able to consolidate and validate uh, the occupation of Mapuche land, and which is also inseparable from epistemological um, colonialism, understand as um, the occupation legitimized. And uh, in this sense, we, we um, locate the notion of uh, territorial ordering of um, territorial planning as uh, hegemonic practices regarding the implementation um, as well of uh, public policies. And in front of these practices, 
of uh, territorial appropriation and these ways of understanding the territory and the relationships within the people and the territories, what is um, what they, they are able to do, what the human being is able to do with the territory. Um, vis a vis the, the, the dominant forms um, and this concept of uh, territorial ordering, um, how the um, how the Mapuche lens um, of the of the link with the territory are uh, uh, are always there. They exist before the state but somehow there have been, of course, efforts to subjugate these forms of organization. And in this sense, um, the project is very focused on, on bring this uh, indigenous knowledge that comes from um, uh, uh, forms of knowledge that, that come from specifically the, the territory, directly from the territory, uh, we can we can talk about the Mapuche, of course, but also about other peoples that have developed during centuries, particular forms of existing within the territory. About the, pro the project itself is developed in Tirúa, in the south of Chile. It is a territory where mainly Mapuche Lafquente people live. These communities are very close to the sea. Let's say the urban, uh, the urban area of Chirua goes more to, to the sea. So this is part of the livelihood of the territory of the community of the territories, activity related to sea and farming of products like the potato and also recollection of seaweed. So this project is like a participatory action and the research team, Magdalena, Miguel and I thought about this organization of the space from the Mapuche World Beer. And then we started the collaborative work with the with the territory and the Pulaskente community. So we were currently going there to visit them and talking about the outreach of the study and a meaning for the territory and that it's useful for the territory. So from that framework, we start to delimitate the products that are going to come out from this work. As Magdalena said, this is still not over. And we've been for more than a year talking about the outreach of the study and the possibility of having results. For example, this presentation where we can talk about the methodology of the project. And there are also some delir deliverables that are only for the territory. And there they establish this collaborative work in the construction. We also had uh, we had some interns in the beginning. Back then they were students. Now they are already graduated. Some of them are even studying a graduate degree. So we've been carrying this work for years. Actually. Here we have a map of the Tirua area. It's that red point here for the people who are not from Chile. This is part of Madro Zona Sur. This is a part of Mapuche conflict. 
there are some sabotage actions against mainly forest industry. So these Mapuche communities are claiming back their territories and the Chilean state is uh, attacking through militarization of the territory. As we were saying, we have this idea of the organization of the Mapuche Lafkense territory opposing the state organization of the area and the purpose. The Chilean government also has named this zone as a conflict zone, as a tension zone in inside communities and with industries, extractive industries. So these ways of organization in Mapuche territories are opposed or are different than what the state is imposing. So we have a different ways of planning and different ways of relating with the territory. So we have presented all of this in the methodological point of view. Quedan dos minutos. Two minutes left. Okay. So here's the need to think again, to rethink methodologies with a participatory approach adapted to the Mapuche protocols, to the knowledge of this Mapuche people with the goal of centering this knowledge and urban, uh, sorry, territorial planning. So this is related to the existence and pre-existence in the territory. Concretely, we use three mechanisms, of course, Everything related with storytelling, particularly a través de hablar de knowledge, where elders will talk about Mapuche history. This has been key to our project. So documenting this knowledge has been crucial, and also the arrival of families to the Tirua due to this, uh, this session, let's say, that the Chilean state forced them to. A second mechanism has been uh, walks around the area along with this oral tradition from elders and also def defining the borders of the territory. Many of the elders hadn't had in some of these places before, places that they would have heard about, places that they knew existed, but had never been there. Also from these conversations, from the elders came the idea to document this with filming. So um, young, younger people could listen to their stories. This, along with some other products that we agreed on, the production of a book from the Mapuche Lafkente point of view, and also being a contribution to a report that the communities have that has some strategic outcomes. Before going to the limitations of the study, we wanted to recreate or we wanted to film this conversation in Mapuzungun, the Mapuche language. 
we, we didn't want to make this in Spanish. So we could also preserve the Mapungun. So now let's talk about the contributions. First of all, it is to understand that the Mapuche people and all the peoples have their own ways to plan their territories that it has been hidden due to the mainstream planning mechanisms. So we are trying to make this visible to bring it to the table throughout a political exercise in the territory. We want to contribute to the strategic goals of the territory all the work that they are carrying out there. Uh, regarding the limitations of the study, of course, our own colonialism, that it is sometimes to get it out of our head. Not only our intercolonialism, but also epistemic and industrial colonialism. There are also cases like examples that are constant, but we want to go beyond there. And last but not least, one of our constant questions is if there is there is possible to decolonize without a territorial restitution. As Natalia was saying, the exercise that we're doing here is trying to think in other methodological approaches to be a contribution and to make planning meaningful. In this case, in a specific from the Mapuche point of view, the answer here is the work that can be achieved through a process like this, that it is of course limited uh, from many different points of view, also material limitations. If we think about walks in the territory where private property is there, so it is not easy to just walk around. This is just a little space, a little step in the work that so many others have been making in this space, producing knowledge that can be somehow followed closely and of course being also uh, some contribution for different spaces of struggle for the Mapuche people and also the Tirua area. So that would be it from us and we're open to continue discussing about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you, Magdalena, for your presentation, Magdalena and Natalia. So we're going to the last presentation of this discussion group or colleague Javiera Solar, which is entitled Construction of the Pehuenche Cultural Landscape and Guidelines for its Conservation within the Urban Planning of Alto Bio. So I'll let you take the floor. Good afternoon. One, uh, there's there's a mistake on my name. Um, but uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, my studies, I'm doing my masters. Uh, so I'm trying to deepen uh, within this conflict. So in terms of this uh, conflict uh, within the, the Pehuenche territory and the construction of the Pehuenche cultural landscape and guidelines to its conservation within the urban planning of Alto Bio Bio. I would like to say that I've been working uh, within the territory of Alto Bio Bio since my internship. Um, within my bachelor, I, I did a research on uh, urban territories 
Alto Bio Bio in an urban area, which is Ralfco, uh, through different um, historic events. We have seen some loss of the territory. Uh, and finally, the, the area was structured uh, as a city. So we began uh, with a diagnosis of the density of the population and the communities that inhabit the territory to give you a uh, context and uh, to understand how this territory uh, works. We have the 84 of the population of this village um, belongs to the Pehuenche community. We, we can see here uh, in comparison with the quantity of population, of total population. But we need to understand that the migration is, is very high. Um, so so the, the total population um, doesn't vary so much or, or doesn't grow so much. So one of the main um, motivations to, to develop the research of uh, cultural territoriality of this Pehuenche um, cultural landscape was to preserve um, these communities and their cultural landscape. Um, we see here Ralco in a little bit black, which is the urban area. And then we go through an analysis or a research uh, regarding the concepts that are um, related to a territory, which is uh, territorial dispossession, uh, the territorial reduction uh, within the, the territory itself, the land itself, and the communities as well. Women uh, here, where, where we see dispossession within uh, Pehuenche territories, where uh, they can no longer enter as a property uh, private property concept uh, is working strongly there, so they cannot uh, longer enter these territories and lands. Uh, another concept is cultural landscape. I studied it through uh, several definitions. Can understand uh, is understand it as an heritage um, and a cultural heritage of every territory, and we can also um, say that this is a cultural baggage or, or, or a memory baggage. Here we see Kayaki uh, formed by 300 families. We can see here in the picture between uh, the two rivers. It is one of the communities that live outside the main city. Uh, and it's one of the villages that have more territorial conflict that live with a northern limit um, that, that generates constant threats because it's growing, of course. Um, this urban settlement grows. And after that, we did a study of, of the settlement through satellites. It was one of the, it is one of the easier ways to understand the urban territories. And through 2013 till, till now, we see the, the community, but we don't see a growth. We see a division of the community. Uh, we see, of course, a division of the land where um, property is the, the main actor within the village. So regarding spatial information, we can also go to history and bibliography. We have here, uh, this is supported by a Pehuenche book from, uh, from the 90s, but it's one uh, that has the most information uh, about this community. Um, this is from the, from the 800s, where this community uh, is settled. Um, the their its boundaries are more natural because it, there's the river and the mountains. We see here in 1950 the reduction of the community, where you see the yellow dots are uh, 
condense into farms. Uh, farms are constituted and we can see how they advance. And, and you can see the, the, the formation of farms as a whole. Then during the 70s and 80s, INDEP uh, administers the territory and we can see that the historical limits uh, are no longer there. What we see there is that during uh, these times, we um, we see this a total reduction of kayaki. We see subdivision of lands. Um, the farms are also donated. Um, so as Ralco is uh, founded as city, we, we know it right now as um, the political center of the of the whole city. So this is, of course, um, newer, is updated. And this example here um, is, is, is also, was also made with the leaders of the Kayaki community. We see the total reduction of the community that exists today. What we see in yellow is inhabitants of the city, but with uh, land grant titles, individual and private. And what we see in red on top of the map is where the yeah, community uh, is there by itself uh, with the logic of community, uh, with basic supplies. And also the limits here that are related with natural areas and water bodies according to the logics of the Pehuenche peoples. Here, yes, uh, these are, are some images from a documentary um, that I have been studying. Uh, it's it's very hard to get information from the communities if you, if you don't go on the ground, but the information that I got from here is also very interesting. Uh, we can see how they explain the dispossession and how the, the, the refugee is abandoned um, in contrast uh, of, uh, of an urban growth and also in terms of uh, the railroad. Also, uh, we see here described a general problematic uh, which, uh, with three central problematics, which is a lack of recognition and valuation of the Pehuenche people and a lack of a framework of the conservation of the landscape itself. From uh, the previous uh, knowledge uh, in terms of uh, urban urbanism, uh, when, when you think that urbanism is also to put into value landscape, we, we, we see this uh, main question, what are the criteria uh, for the conservation of this cultural landscape of the Yaki community? Um, having having in mind a potential uh, urbanization of the city. So this is the methodological focus with a qualitative, with a qualitative um, approach to develop the, the study. Uh, with a continuous participation of the community itself. We have data collection, um, bibliography, the edification of uh, key stakeholders. We have um, non-structured um, surveys, um, let's say open with the leaders of the community and also um, an analysis of the geography of the territory to show how the wenches live. So we analyze the cultural landscape and we identify two big groups of elements within the landscape. Um, we have uh, cultural elements of living together in community. Uh, that is, uh, of course, shadowed by the division uh, uh, based on the private property. We see uh, exchange, uh, commercial exchange with Argentina uh, which is uh, a traditional ancestral um, activity uh, before before the, the Spaniards. And there's also uh, another activity that it's carried out 
uh, during summer and is developed to, to seek shelter uh, during winter. So the, the, these practices um, have to do uh, with the inhabitation in a territory, some uh, geographical elements, um, such as the presence of the mountain itself. So we have a characterization um, to seek guidelines um, within within legislation and with the bibliography that we're using. For example, we see here um, cultural landscape here um, that defines some landscapes where there's a historical passage and there are historical sites, uh, of course, and ethnographic sites. We have some guidelines by the UNESCO that are also in conflict. And, and it, we need to, to criticize these criteria from the UNESCO. We have uh, three landscapes, define, evolutive, and associative, but, um, but are more uh, conceptual categories and ineffective if we try to apply them to the territory itself. So we have here a proposal to try to uh, um, reach a, a collective understanding. Um, here, for example, Uh, the idea is to uh, value, again, um, the, the territory, the land, and the culture within. But uh, this is what is uh, proposed. This is um, on its early stages. Uh, we're working with it, uh, with the surveys that are being carried out. But as a conclusion here, we have there's a lack of an institutional framework that protects and safeguards the uh, cultural elements and in terms of landscapes um, in the Kayaki community, we're expecting it to change with the law, uh, the heritage law, but somehow we are expecting that the landscape um, is also within law. Uh, Chile does not have a legal body that incorporates the cultural landscape uh, beyond the, the, the UNESCO concept and we don't have either um, uh, an integrated work uh, be, uh, among the institutions because there's not a common methodological base within the institutions. Thank you very much for your attention. Ah, yeah. Okay, so we'll go first with the questions that you might have for the current speaker, and then we'll go with the questions that you might have for the previous speakers. So, any questions for Javiera Solar? If there are no questions, then we can go with the questions for the other speakers. Pueden haber preguntas para Caterina, entonces. No, no, para todo el mundo, no, no está informado de eso. Eh, ¿Alguien del, del público tendrá alguna consulta? No? Bueno, yo tengo una, una pregunta un poco más relacionada al tema del, del Congreso. I have eh, a question related to the Congress. Regarding your study of the landscape, what kind of property do you think that is more um, that is 
that comes with more harmony, let's say, from the different perspective. Okay, that's a good question. I think that in this context, and also thinking of the worldview of the Pehuente people, I think that the best way would be a collective way and thinking of the territory as a community. One of the things that they are um, sad about, let's say, that they regret is that they do not have contact with other communities. So they have no contact with different ways of life. So this contact and this collectivity should be applied there in a territory. Of course, each community have their own way of life and their own rules, but maybe this contact is necessary. Thank you. I have a question for Dante. Dante, about the topic of indigenous markets. If in the case of your study, the topic of the market is also related with industrialization. In the Colombian case, there is a strength of indigenous industry, the production of products like um, sodas and coca, products that need a high amount of industrialization. And I wanted to ask you if it also happens in the context of Arica. Can you hear me? I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Great. So in Arica in particular, that industrialization doesn't exist. Farmers produce with greenhouses, with solar panels. So we cannot talk about the big industry. It is small, but if we think of them as a group, it looks big. So if we think of the production of the Azapa Valley, is the one that is mainly in, in Santiago. So those tomatoes come from indigenous hands, from indigenous families and and it is a big production but it's still um agricultural product not there is no a production chain okay any other question for the speakers that are online Bueno, Magdalena y Natalia, me gustaría saber si pudieran hablarnos un poco más. Eh, Magdalena, sobre... Natalia, could you please speak a bit more about your study? Um, you name some elements, but I would like to know how did you include the people you work with in your project in the decision-making process, people from the communities? 
Ms. Natalia, would you like to go first? Can you hear? Eh, no sé el nombre de la persona que hizo la pregunta, pero muchas gracias. I don't know the name of the person who asked, but thank you very much. We have different ways of answering this. The initial conversations about the possibility of working with this notion of territorial planning, they started back in 2014. Natalia and Miguel, we didn't know each other very well. So we started talking about this. And then when it was more possible about doing this work and financing the work because it needs us to go there and to generate the logistical conditions like, I don't know, getting cars, food for all the people who participate, etc. That took some years, as Natalia said, and then in 2018, we started talking with Asociación Huéculao. And there were some pictures in the presentation. We had three or four presentations with people from different organizations. And we said, okay, we are a group of people who now things from the academia, territorial topics, territorial planning. There is something in the territory that we could do and that could be useful for the community. And that's when we started to have ideas about documenting this, having conversation with elders, and talking about territorial claims, creating some information for CONIT, which is the Agency for Indigenous Peoples in Chile. And beyond that, we also had the idea of producing and documenting the history of the people from their own knowledge. I don't know if I'm answering up and if I'm actually answering the question, but back in 2014, this is started. And then we went to the territory, we talked with elders that the association itself identified who are the people we had to talk to first. And from those conversations, more ideas came, like creating video, filming, I don't know if I'm missing anything. If we would have to say in which parts of the project they have participation, it's in the objective. We checked it many times in the in these meetings and the products and also methodologies. So we created the title and we got the resources, but from their own word, it has been flexible. We had also the pandemic in the middle, so it has also influenced in the time. It has made this longer. So all the time we are in this, definition, step by step of the project. Thank you for your answer. We have another question here. Buenos días, Juan Manuel. Eh, Edith Good morning, Juan Manuel. Edith Gamboa. Shall I continue? Yes, good morning. Bueno, yeah, I yes, I think Rolando is not here, but Juan is here. Well, as we are just starting, uh, I think there'll, there'll be the space later. But um, first, Juan Manuel was speaking about two groups, uh, an urban one and a rural one in Puerto Boyacá. 
uh, this Embera group or community. Um, I don't know if they're from the same family or different families, but um, um, I was wondering if this group, uh, one of the groups have uh, has relationships with the other group. Uh, as, uh, as speaking about this interculturality, as he perceived within his research, and my own question as a person um, before researcher, of course, or professor, uh, is that um, some images that Juan Manuel presented, uh, these houses or let well tents that uh, it's impossible to can see. Uh, I know some group uh, because my 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 grandparents from my mother's side uh, in Colombia are, are from uh, this certain groups and we know how they live. And I think it's so violent to live uh, under these conditions that you showed uh, with the, uh, on tents like you showed. It's very shocking, uh, understanding as well that housing in Colombia is not the best. So um, my question is, how, how how were your feelings to continue for the research as a person? And I also wanted to congratulate you because I, I kind of saw your, your uh, publications. Hola, me escuchan? Hello, you can hear me? Hola, me escuchan? Sí. Hello, can you hear me? Ah, bueno. ah, yes, okay, perfect. So, uh, thank you very much um, for, for your inputs. Um, regarding the first question, yes, there are two communities. Um, one is uh, entitled as Catquivo and Tami. Um, they both uh, belong. Uh, from uh, they both belong to the same place. They are related. Let's say initially, um, the displacement uh, of by the from the, the armed conflict was parallel, but the cons the constitutionality the, the process uh, put them together. They stay there for, let's say, 10 years. And the family growth, the side of the of the plot and resource scarcity arose tensions between them. So uh, what occurred to finally separate these two communities was the killing of one of the leaders. And after this homicide, they, they ended up separating and the ones that were living in tents returned to another territory and um, the, the community um, entitled as families stayed uh, on the territory. So uh, the ones that returned the rural lands uh, had a great time because the armed conflict was still there. And so they were displaced again and when they came back to Guayaca, they did not stay uh, on the same settlement, but they, they stayed uh, they, 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 uh, in the city. They made uh, urban settlements. Um, they, there are marriages between them. They have family together. There are tensions as well. But um, we need to see in that uh, the fact that there are two uh, communities um, makes this this interconnections, these interrelations. Uh, they 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 go from one community to another. They take a walk. Let's say so. Yes, they are interrelated. They are almost like a family. They have constant con constant uh, contact, but there are also tension between them both. And um, very briefly, uh, uh, this was also happening in Bogota, in the city. Um, they, there were many uh, 
families from both groups and the Bogota district unites them uh, within one single um, plot. So they, they, they fought uh, against the other. Uh, there, the, there were uh, tensions and conflicts, but uh, not because of being embedded, but because of the constitutional uh, pressure. So um, regarding the, the, the second question you made, um, regarding the, the, the conditions, of course, it's difficult, but when you are in these settlements, as well as the one that they established in Bogota in the park, uh, I talked about it that they were there for six months. Uh, we, we, we saw in this, uh, we see in these places uh, hunger, of course, but you can also see solidarity among them that maintains um they able they're able to live through precariousness and um this solidarity is um what i feel allowed me to relate more with them because uh uh this is not like a research that went there uh took their knowledge and then went to university and i graduated um what i pretended was to generate collective spaces to strengthen this internal organization within the community. So um, my presence, um, I was I was looking um, for I was I was looking to strengthen um, the lobby, to strengthen the tools, um, to be with them uh, through these these processes of uh, land reivindication, land claims. So this solidarity, of course. Um, carries as well the, the, the weight of the resistant processes. That will be my answer. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, I don't know if Zoom somebody has uh, some question or maybe someone here. Oh, yes. Rolando left, yes. Okay, so here we have a question. Uh, one question for Katerin, uh, but also a general reflection. Uh, it caught my interest, this um, urban expansion, uh, where we see that the same phenomena, uh, the, 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 the concept of resguardo, um, this this uh, concept of of lobbies that are some kind of uh, authority uh, at the local level uh, has uh, has it uh, evolved uh, because I think this is a projection uh, from from the own people uh, how has it evolved this this lobby. Thank you very much uh, for your question. Actually, um, the topic of the territorial city, um, Bogotá is the, 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 the capital of the country. And uh, at a certain moment, there were um, territorial claims that actually achieved the recognition uh, of, of certain, let's say, buildings that were given uh, to the indigenous peoples where they were allowed to carry out certain practices. This, this does not include uh, a certain uh, indigenous people that had already the rights, but the other ones were able to achieve uh, the reivindication of some houses, some buildings, but the, the, the land claim and in relation to the armed conflict that um, my colleague also speaks about, um, it is thought that the land claim um, has, has to do with going back to the rural areas and does, uh, doesn't have to do with uh, living in the city uh, in another way. So, um, for example, we have thinking houses, um, we have uh, 
places for, for indigenous children so that the community is being integrated in the city uh, through certain mechanisms. But we also um, have to look at specific uh, policies um, and to made, make the, the, the city uh, an habitable place for indigenous peoples regarding access to, to territory and land. So uh, no, uh, regarding your question, there is no possibility of claiming territories within the city uh, unless they were uh, private property of the indigenous families. Um, del público online y los de los acá presentes podríamos dar por finalizada nuestra primera mitad de la jornada del seminario de Teurf luego retomamos a la, con la charla magistral de Blomley a las 3 de la tarde ¿sí? a las 2 y media perdón, a las 2 y media <ríe> eh, quedan invitados ahora al, al almuerzo que aquí al ladito aquí mismo <ríe> y nos juntamos en este mismo auditorio, los que estén aquí presentes y en los mismos links, en las mismas transmisiones, a las dos y media de la tarde. Que tengan buena tarde. We will come back at 2.30 for the next presentations, uh, specifically uh, of Professor Nicholas Blumley. <laughs>